All right, so we're actually going to go, then we'll do an origin thing. So let's go back to your beginnings. Yes. Uh, when did you know you want to be a production a designer? Well, I actually, growing up, I was the artist. I was drawing in my bedroom. I was doing caricatures of everyone I knew. I was the artist in the family and in, with my friends. But I didn't know that production design and working in television actually existed as a career. But I loved comedy. I used to audio record The Tonight Show and love comics. And I was an artist, and so I went to art school. During art school, uh, there was a class that was canceled, and I was roaming the hallways, and on the wall there was a flyer that said, uh, interns needed at CBS. And you know how they talk about like the light bulb moment? Yeah. I had the light bulb moment of, wait, I can apply my art and work at a television show? And that show was The Joan Rivers Show. Oh. And three weeks after getting that job as an intern, making no money, Joan needed some artwork on the scene for a show, an episode, and she said, have the art kid do it. I was the art kid. That was my first credit. That was the first time I got artwork on a TV show, and that started my entire career up until this day. All came from that moment. So what were you, uh, so when you're back in school, because I always tell my students who to, who to study, who were you study from a production design standpoint, like what films or TV shows? Well, to be honest, I was not, I was a fan of like, the Batman 66 colorful craziness. I was a fan of Star Wars. I was a fan of all the gadgets and the props and the guns. But again, I would look at those shows and those movies as something somebody else did. I did not know that I could have a job doing that. And now, years later, with Key and Peel and Workaholics and Miracle Workers and all the other shows that I do, I'm making all those crazy you know, decisions to have props and spaceships and guns and things made just like I did when I was a kid. Well, if you, if you touch on QMP a little, it was really a series of short films. The, the show is really, is just like cinematic short films. I don't know how many, see, how many we don't 320 of them. 320, so how was that maybe shaping your career? Because you had to do different genres. Within like the genre, each time it's a little different every short film, does that kind of help maybe uh, round you out as an artist. I really appreciate you noticing that it was cinematic because that was a decision that was made by the director and by myself and by the costume designer and by Jordan and Keegan to not let it look like a sketch comedy show but to make little movies. So we approached every single one as it was a $200 million film, and so you're right, it was a crash course in sci-fi, 1800s, period pieces, current pieces, and all of that is based in making sure your research is good, making sure that you have a mind that goes, you know it would be really funny if grandma had this on her counter, and then you have a great crew of set decorators and art directors and prop masters and graphic designers who bring all of their education and their experience to the table, and they're helping create a set that is only going to stand for four hours because we would shoot it before lunch. So every favorite Key and Peele sketch, no matter how cinematic and beautiful it looked, only lasted four hours and it was on a truck and we were shooting the next one because we would shoot 10 a week. So that ability and that experience gives me the opportunity on every job interview that I go on to say, oh, I've done sci-fi, I've done westerns, I've done, you know, well, you name it, I've done it on Key and Peele, and fortunately that show is a big hit, and people go, oh, well, if you did that, you know what you're doing. I remember talking to Jordan about my favorite episode, The uh, Race of Zombies. Uh, <laughs> but he was like, he just liked it because you could experiment. Like, it was a big experimental, I actually said it was his best education working on that show as a writer and you know, an actor. And, and what I'll say about that is that as an art department, what we did was we made sure that everything was rooted in realism. We never tried mm -hmm. to compete visually with the performances that Jordan and Keegan were doing. So let them shine and let our racist zombie sets look like The Last of Us. Let it look like The Walking Dead. Let's not try to do funny stuff on the sets, let's make people at home go, wow, this looks so real, and then in turn, it is so funny of what's happening. So now we have upcoming, let's say we have a lot of upcoming students watch our show, how can they get uh, the experience they need? Oh, Good. Well, um, to me it's very, it's extremely difficult and extremely hard at the same time, and also not hard, and that is, and I know that sounds convoluted, but if you want to work in television and do what I do on Key and Peele and Workaholics or any other types of shows, 
you already know you want to do that, but you think that there's a big wall that's preventing you from doing it. You think of your favorite three favorite television shows or movies. You go on IMDb and you pick the department of who you want to be. You want to be in the camera department, costumes. Let's say you want to be a writer, producer, editor. You scroll down the credits and pick a few people. You follow them on Instagram. You comment on their things. Maybe then you find their email address. Hi, I'm a student. Um, I don't have any experience. I'm studying and whatever, but I'm interested in being a production designer someday. Here's some of my work. I really admire your work. How can I do what you do? Now, you'd be surprised how many people will write back and mentor and say, you should meet this person, you should meet that person. I then look at their Instagram. I look to see if they have a website or what their work is at school. And if they seem like they have the hustle and the sort of dedication to get it done and to work in television, I'll mentor people. I'll introduce them to people. People keep in touch with me. And then here's what happens. You're in school. I book a job where I don't have a budget. It's like $5,000 on the weekend to shoot a music video. Do you know who I'm going to call? I'm going to call that student of yours who has been reaching out to me, who I know wants to do what I do, and say, would you be interested in being an art director on my music video? Now you're in. Okay, now you've got that credit. Now you're then meeting other people on that set, and then you're doing what I'm doing, and you hustle, 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 and in five years, you're booking a show like Key and Peel because you've thrown yourself in there and you're brave and you're a rock star. And the final thing I'll say is, call if you're a student, call yourself, title yourself who you want to be in 10 years. Mm. So if you want to be a cinematographer or a production designer or an editor, on your Instagram bio, call your, you're an editor. You're not gonna get hired on a job that you're not qualified for anyway. But the minute you start calling yourself what you want to be, the world responds and says, we're going to offer you some opportunities to be in the art department or be an editor. And let's be honest, like if you're hiring that student for your video, your low budget, eventually you're going to get a big budget yes. and you're going to hire that person. So <laughs> I, yeah, I, can, yeah, yeah. I can tell your students and I can tell you that my entire career is all of that. It's people that came to me as a PA. Mm -hmm. I noticed a hustle and a talent. I hired them on a show, on a big show. I then got them in the union and they became a, maybe um, a buyer or an assistant art director. And then they became an art director or a set decorator. Then they left me and they became a production designer. And I can tell you dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And I still to this day do that because that's how this industry works. You start at the bottom, no matter what your ego is, no matter who you think you are, you start at the bottom and you bust your butt to move up and meet people. All right, so we're going to go a little euphoria. Okay, so you have, uh, it's a high school. You have the drug underculture, violence. You have a lot of different genres, let's say. Well, what's the one? What were the challenges doing the sound for that? Oh, boy, what weren't the challenges? <laughs> no, it was honestly so fun. Everyone was so great to work with. Um, the music, so we worked on season two and not one, so we knew we were coming into something that had a, such a big fan base, such iconic score from Labyrinth. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, sexual activities in this show that need sound to them. And it's that's probably my, one of my favorite, not favorite, but it's like when I tell stories about Euphoria, it's always funny because I'm like, I'm in a room with the director and executives of HBO, and we are meticulously crafting some very interesting <laughs> sounds. And I'm just sitting there like, this is my job? This is what I'm doing in a room full of people that I would be embarrassed to tell my parents about? So it's, but it's, you know, it's all for the art and it's really fun and everyone's so professional about it. And it's, it's just, it's really exciting. <laughs> was there any episode or sequence that you were pr particularly proud of? Like, oh my God, I, we, this was hard, but we pulled it off. Oh, absolutely. So season, uh, yeah, season two, episode five, we call it Rue on the Run. And it's, uh, Rue is basically running from the police because she robs some jewelry from a house to pay some drug debts that she has. And she thinks the police are there because she robbed a house, but really she's this, you know, drug addict that they found on the streets. And so it's almost like this Ferris Bueller sequence where he's running from the backyard to backyard. So it's so fun because you have a quinceanera that she runs through and you have the mariachi band playing 
And then we have um, a, a guy who's listening to old music and he has chickens everywhere. And then we have a backyard pool party. And then we have um, a, a, another backyard with all these little mini little chihuahuas yapping at her. She runs by. So it's like it was like a parade of very unusual backyards happening at 12 o'clock at night. And, I, and it was really fun to, to work that sequence out. <laughs> the question we're asking is, uh, when did you know early in life when you could actually do this as a career? Like you could transfer your love of it actually to making a career. Yeah, so I, it's funny, I originally wanted to be a veterinarian and I, I interned at a vet hospital all through my high school career and six months before graduation, I was like, I want to go to film. It's like, mom and dad, I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. I'm going to go to film. And of course they were like, oh boy. And they were like, okay. So they, they supported me. Um, but I, you know, I made videos growing up. We would make silly, just videos in my neighborhood. Um, but I actually started as a video editor in school and did a lot of visual effects. And I, I didn't even know audio, I didn't even think of audio as a career path until I took my first post-production sound class. And we went to a field trip to my teacher's studio and we walked in and it had this huge console with all these flashing lights and, and faders and buttons. I thought I was in a, like the cockpit of a spaceship. And I was like, this is amazing looking. I was like, I want to know what every button does. I want to be the guy that can sit at this chair and just like know what he's doing. Because I thought that was so impressive. And that really was the spark of my like audio journey. I was like, I just, I want to know everything about audio. It just, it seems complex. I'm a very technical guy. I love technology. And so that, that really threw me into wanting to learn everything about audio. And, and then it just snowballed from there. So yeah. Dark Obsession, what are the challenges of writing a part for yourself? <laughs> um, yeah, I think some of the challenges is you kind of have to take yourself out of it, but also know what you can do as an actor, I would say. And so that was a, a quarantine movie, actually. We did that summer of 2020. So it was me and my producing partner, George Henry Horton. Um, just we were stuck in a house for five months and kind of spent two months, months developing that script. And then we bubbled a bunch of people at the house and shot that film. Um, and then, yeah, it was really just kind of being honest with myself of knowing what I could do as, as an actor or things that seemed exciting and really um, I was passionate about and passionate about portraying. But when you're writing, do you want to at the same time maybe like, oh, I'm not going to worry about the acting part right now? Do I want to like, I want to find the story and it means I've got to push myself a little further than normal. That's okay. Well, yeah, of course we're following structure. I think we went through 12 drafts. We did table reads. I spent, sent it to so many friends to get their feedback because I was like, I'm writing this for myself. Let me make sure that everyone else is understanding what I'm trying to portray. Because in my mind, I'm like, this all makes sense. But I'm, I sent it to as many friends as I could to really get um, constructive feedback to make sure that everything was working story-wise. I always teach the students, uh, be very hard on your protagonist as yeah. a writer. Yeah. So are you, are you willing to be harder on yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I am always hard on myself, I would say. I am a Virgo. Uh, I love structure. Uh, I want things to be perfect. So I'm always, uh, yeah, definitely, I'm very hard on myself of what level um, of a professional I want to be and what level I want to work at and what where I want to see my future at. So I have to be hard on myself now to get to the larger films that I want to one day work on. All right, So now, but now we're actually we're in production phase. Yes. Um, you're acting. So at that point, how do you balance the acting writing thing on that? Because you do have to do rewrites, theoretically. Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that a difficult part where you got to switch in and out? Um, I would say it's very fluid on the day because you're there on set kind of improv and talking through the scenes or I'll act the scene and I was like, ooh, I feel like we're missing a beat. This isn't logically connecting these two, two plot points. How can we shift into that? So that was a very like amorphous process, I would say, and just being open to being collaborative with your other uh, department heads. And at the same time, you might have to go back and rewrite that night for, oh, we got to set it up a little better or something like that. Yeah. We also came back and did reshoots and added another 10 minutes to the film once we cut it together and we're like, oh, we're missing things. So we came back and did another week of shooting to solidify the story. So you seem to like multiple hats. I do, a, a, I direct, I write, produce, act, I edit, and I first say D, and I'm a professor. Right, that was actually my <laughs> last question, because I, uh, I teach. It is just yeah. like, so how does, how does that, the professorship feed into your, you think, creatively? 
Um, I actually, I started this September at Cal State LA and it was actually really wonderful because the strike was happening and kind of gave me hope every week coming to see these kids so excited to make film. And also I kind of had to relearn some things that I already knew to teach them the basics of film. And uh, I was choosing films that I thought would inspire them that I really love. Um, so it really helped me um, also just with communication and clarity um, with students. So now I know when I, I'm directing a, a film in June, I feel like I have a very clear idea. And uh, uh, being a professor is also kind of like practicing your craft as a producer and director because you have to communicate ideas clearly to people. Plus, the film industry can be jading sometimes or difficult. Yeah. It's kind of refreshing when you got people really eager to learn. And they're so <laughs> excited, and they're like, nothing bad has happened to them yet. <laughs> okay, so what what uh, what made you want to moderate this panel? I think I was just so excited to talk to all the different creatives and really get to ask them interesting questions that I don't feel like we usually ask. I think for me, it was really important with this panel to kind of ask the questions that are always in the back of your mind. Um, and do it in a way where I really let all my amazing uh, fellow panelists shine. So it was kind of like double duty. All right, so what is your research process? How do you want to research the guests so you get the background, so prepare for it? I think you have to, if you're, you know, I think of like Eric on One Piece, you have to at least watch one episode of his show. I think it's trying to watch everything you can about the people, because that's really going to set you apart, is if you can ask specific targeted questions or really thoughtful questions, that's going to be the thing that makes somebody turn around and go, wait, I want to talk to them. So I think it's just a bunch of research. It's great. You, you have to watch TV and movies. Um, and then just kind of thinking about, you know, you can have the obvious questions, and then sometimes with certain PR people, they want you to ask their clients specific questions. But when you can think of something that, try to think of what they haven't been asked or something you're personally interested in, I think that really sets you apart as a moderator or an, or an interviewer. Well, you know, that's one of the problems where they get asked the same question over and over oh again. They, if you can touch on something, a minor scene yeah. that they really like of a part of the artistry, yeah. yeah. Or if you talk about something maybe a little earlier in their career that was really important to them, if you, if you can do a deep cut, everyone loves a deep cut. Right. Now, what about the juggling the panelists? There's always a challenge, yeah. you know, generally, how do, would you approach to making sure each panelist gets their moment, you yeah. know, and then, you know, to steer questions if someone's not getting it? I think it's like, you know, it's so funny, I grew up acting and doing improv classes, so I think it is, it's a dance. I think you don't want to over, you want to know what you need to say, but not over prepare, and like, go into the panel knowing that there's going to be a little bit of wiggle room, and just acknowledging it, embracing it, and then I actually, it was funny, I told all the panelists, like, because no one wants to get the move to next question card, I said, I'll probably say something like, amazing, great job, that's great advice. And that's a way to kind of gently give them the signal that, okay, it's time to jump to someone else. But all the panelists today, they made my job so easy. They were all wonderful and respectful. But again, if I had a, if I had a rambler, that's kind of how I would have done it. All right, so we always have the same question for especially the editor. What was your emotional reaction when you first read the script? That is such a great question. Um, I loved it. it. I'm a big fan of horror, and so for me, it was a great, you know, I, it was exciting to read it. And especially once I talked with the director, Ben, about it after reading it, like, we really connected on the tone and the pace and, like, what the movie was going to feel like. So it was a great read. It was really fun. All right, so then, all right, so what was, what was most challenging sequence? What was the most, actually, things that, oh, boy, this one's a little difficult and had to go through some... Editing rewrites, let's call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it was, it's interesting because the structure of this film has a lot to do with like night and day, and like, and there's a creature in it, and so we actually had to like restructure like when the creature would, when we'd first see it and stuff like that. So I'd say that's the most difficult part was like the, the overall structure of the film, working within the constraints of the story and the movie and being like, when do we really want these things to happen on screen in the story as it's presented now? It does seem horror genre as compared to most genres has that, you have to really be laser focused because you can't reveal the monster too early like the thing in the 50s. Uh, so do you, is it a horror genre something you really like enjoy editing or do you open to all? Yeah, well, I'm open to all, but I started in horror and thriller, and then I kind of have been in comedies the last few years, and then I finally got back to horror, and it was great. Like, I, this is a really classic horror thriller, and I really enjoyed it, so I love it. So what was, when you first read the script, what was it about you made you join the project? Fantasy. I mean, everything about, like, anything with dragons. It, 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 it just reminded me of my childhood, like, watching all these movies from the past, like Willow and, you know, Dragon Slayer and Dragon Heart and... 
anyway, um, that's what kind of attracted me to the project. And I'm like, I have to be a part of it somehow. So I, uh, I emailed the director and then this email led to like a phone call and a phone call led to a lunch and then so on and so forth. Then I got hired after I sent him some, some samples of the work. He's like, we should get together and do this for real. So that's how it started. Wow, so you cold call it. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Uh, but, but speaking of, uh, you're curious you say that because I always tell my students, how important is, this? so you do have to find the emotional connection whenever you yeah. look at a script. And it could be abstract sometimes. Yes, yeah. yeah. It has, there has to be something that attracts your, uh, your attention from, but I mean, for, for what I do that's composing for film, I have to also look at the final cut of the picture. So the script gets you excited, and then when you see the film, you're like, oh, great. So music can go here, there, it shouldn't be there. Like, you know, and then we talk about those elements with the director. But yeah, I mean, the script has to excite you, excite you first. And then when you watch the final format, it's like, OK, great. Now we can like, get into the weeds and do some work. OK, so with a little background question, because you know, I, I a, lot of my a lot of students watch the show. Uh, when did you know you wanted to do this for, well, when did you realize, I can make money, maybe, in doing something I love? That's a good question. Um, okay, so I w okay, so I wanted to compose for film when I watched Lord of the Rings in college. Uh -huh. That was the moment where I'm like, it finally. I mean, because I've been watching films since I was a kid um, and renting VC VHSs and like going to the movie movie store and getting them. Um, but that moment when I watched Lord of the Rings, I'm like, something with the picture and the music like got me into it. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And then I just hired I. I connected with a few people I knew in my network and I started with a few commercials and at the time I was teaching music and I scored these 10 jingles at the time which paid I made like what I would make as the teacher in a month I made it in a weekend so I was like oh this is actually can work <laughs> so I pursued that going forward and then you know m made the move to LA and stuff like that because I originally I was in Miami oh. at the time yeah and then made the the trek here and and has been fantastic. So, so then uh, that's an interesting pass. What do you? What do you? What would you recommend for students to watch? Like, if you want to say you want to go back and learn how to compose for a film, were there a couple of films you'd recommend? You really need to see this. Oh yes, yes. I okay. So you have to start with like the golden age of you know movies. So go back, study like Alfred Hitchcock and also Bernard Herrmann, mm -hmm. Psycho. That's like anything with like. Uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, Psycho, Vertigo. Uh, there's also Sunset Boulevard, but that's not him. That's somebody else. Um, and then, obviously, anything with Steven Spielberg, you know. Um, and then David Fincher I like as well. So, um, you know, even B old Peter Jackson as well. So I have to Seems say. like you're hitting a lot of artists that really have mastered music as a character in yeah. a movie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. Th it's, you, I mean, because you want to have a great example to, to work with, right? So I would say it's like studying, like, the masters like Beethoven, Bach, okay. Mozart, stuff like that. So um, that's, a, that's how I would approach it. It's, it it'll, you'll learn a lot just by studying those films and listening to the music as well. What was the biggest challenging of, uh, you know, casting for the traders? Honestly, trying to make sure we represent as many people as possible. You know, we only had a pretty small cast, you know, 20 people is really not that much. Um, and you want to be able to get everyone in there, right? Um, so it's really, really important for us to obviously have the diversity within the cast. We want the different personality types, we want the different races, we want the different types of, you know, jobs. Um, so trying to get all of that and be cohesive was probably the hardest part. It's like a big puzzle piece. <laughs> <laughs> what do you look for in the individual cast members? Like, because it, it's not just you know they fit the thing; they have to actually fit in what right. you're trying to do. Right. Yeah. So every cast member, like we said in the um, in the panel, I made sure that we always had different jobs. We started there, especially with the psychological element. We wanted to make sure that we had people from you know different backgrounds, like political. We wanted people that you know your everyday man. We had an actor in there. We had every different types of facets, and then from there, we wanted to make sure those personalities all blended. So you want someone that that's like a little bit more gullible. You want someone that is, you know, really intelligent. You want an over talker. You want ev all of those. And that's what makes a beautiful recipe for a great television show. Well, I guess in the, in the past, sometimes everybody would be homogenous and yeah. kind of not, you want people with different yeah. points of view just exactly. because it's kind of boring without it. Exactly. All right, so a lot of my students ask me, uh, how does one become a casting director? Uh, when did you know that you could do something you love but someone will give you money for it. 
Oh, I fell into it. I had no idea I wanted to do casting. Um, I went in for an office production assistant job. Um, and literally, as I was walking through the door, they said, hey, we actually filled the position. Um, but do you want to be a casting assistant? And I said, sure, I need a job. I'm in, I just moved to LA. I need something. I um, mean, I fell into it, but I loved it because it was something that I already consumed. And I don't think a lot of people think casting of a job is a job. So it's like, oh my gosh, like, this is great. I get to find cool people that are just on the streets or on Twitter or on Reddit or, you know, TikTok and put them on TV and then they become famous. <laughs> well, so then it's important to uh, put yourself out there because, uh, you know, production, internships, mm -hmm. things that maybe you weren't even thinking you would right. go into. Yeah, absolutely. I think networking is really number one, you know, being able to put yourself out there and talk to different people, slide into someone's LinkedIn, you know, messages. I do that all the time and that's how I make connections of people that I normally never have access to. Um, I had, you know, women reach out to me and say, oh, I didn't know casting was a job, especially reality TV casting. Like, how do I get into it? And it's really just talking to us, networking and seeing and there's job openings because when someone comes and reaches out to me and sends me that resume, there might be that time that like, actually I'm hiring right now and I can put them on. Yeah. Now conversely, now we have a lot of actors that watch that show yes. who might be really talented. Yeah but really terrible at pitching or coming to the casting room. Yes, yes. Uh, that's not their fault, not but their no, fault. of course, I was terrible as a pitcher, mm -hmm. you know, when it came to writing. Mm -hmm. So my question is, so what do you recommend, like what is something you would say, okay, if you're going to a casting room, mm -hmm. make sure you do this or make sure you don't do this? Yeah, I mean, obviously be on time, number one. <laughs> There's a lot of people that always forget, like, oh my gosh, I forgot to do this, I need, you know, they get like five minutes late. You want, first impressions are really everything. If you come prompt, you come ready, you come prepared, that's number one. Um, and then just give it your all, you know, it's going to take practice. You're not going to land every role, and that's okay, because that's just going to better you for your next audition. All right, so University of Michigan, yes. musical theater. Yes. All right, so let's go back to your origin. How did you feel that shaped you in your career today? Ooh, I mean, let's see. I started with dance, went to musical theater, and I think especially as a filmmaker, um, everything that I direct, I'm like very uh, dance, movement, music, Forward. So I ended up like loving directing action, directing movement, directing dance. Um, I think like understanding music really well, reading music, that all like funnels straight into how I do my filmmaking. A lot of times I pick music first um, and I like to play music on set and I think it's just a different, it's a specific type of filmmaking, you know, but I think absolutely um, dance, musical theater, Ha has a thousand percent made me the filmmaker that I am. But you didn't know at the time, you know, so you go into film, you just wanted musical theater. You didn't re realize maybe, hey. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I choreographed a lot, yeah. and I think that was the beginning of directing because it really is seeing this bigger picture and constructing the little pieces. Um, and I'd been choreographing since I was very young. My dance company like really encouraged me to do that. So I think those were the earliest seeds. Um, and then it just sort of was like, wait, musical theater is something that's amazing, but I think that there is so much more for me to do in the grand scheme of uh, the entertainment world. So I just started kind of like taking that choreography instinct and making bigger and bigger things with more elements. Now, how did you transfer? All right, so you graduate, because uh, the students are watching the show are graduating this year. How did that transfer to, hey, I can actually make money at this and doing something I love? Yeah, I mean, I graduated. I was really lucky to have a, um, a great showcase. So I signed with an agent that was by Coastal. I always sort of had this idea of going to LA and maybe expanding beyond musical theater. Um, and so I think a big thing is like following your instincts. And um, I just had, I something in me was like, I don't know, like there's something else. And so I just kept following that and following that. And then I started booking a lot of film and TV as an actor, dancing and everything and um, as well and modeling jobs, commercials. And as I just was spent years and years on set, I was like, I, think I can do the other side of it. And I kept saying that enough times and saying it to enough people where I was like, okay, now I need to like practice what I preach and I have to let go of it being perfect because I have to start. So I think that was a big turning point for me. I was in a feature that I didn't think was like run particularly well. So I left and I was like, I'm gonna start making shorts. I was like, it was like angry. I was like, I can 
I can do it. I just have to figure it out now. So I just started making, and I never stopped. Well, it sounds like the transition from acting to actually controlling your own material was a big choice that a lot of people are not or don't have the opportunity to make. Right, and I also think that the multi-hyphenate of it all is so much more possible now, but we just have to preserve it. You know, I don't want to stop acting, but I want to act in, like, my friend's things, and I want to, you know, like... I don't believe you have to choose one or the other. In fact, being able to go between the two is lovely because then when I get cast in things I just act, I'm like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> you mean I can just like walk in and like leave? Um, and then I go deep dive into the filmmaking side and can go back and forth and sort of have a balanced, a little bit more of a balanced life. Um, but yeah, I think being an actor, just being on set all the time, getting that experience, seeing how things are run, paying attention, watching the directors, um, absolutely helped that transition. How did you get into moderating? Oh, wow. I actually fell into moderating through just the cosplay and um, convention circuit. Uh, a lot of the panels that I started moderating were either costume building related or, you know, something that I was perceived to be an expert on in, in some way. Um, and then through that, met Impact 24 PR, who ran the panel that I'm working with today, and uh, just kind of have been doing it as a little side thing, yeah. So what's your prep work? Because you have, a, you have a lot of guests yeah. on stage, which I know from experience is challenging doing five or six yeah. at a time. So how do you prepare and research? Yeah. These are really nice because um, because they're coming from Impact 24 PR. They do a lot of that work for me, which is so nice. Thank you. I love you. Um, but most of the time, it is a deep dive. It's like, okay, I have five panelists. Let me become as familiar as I can in like however little time I'm given. Um, I like to do just like a good IMDb search, you know. And um, if there are questions that are given to me from them that they want um, answered or asked. I try to do as much research involving uh, that particular question and just familiarize myself with their body of work. You know, um, nine out of ten times the panel encompasses a certain topic, and so it's like get really familiar with that topic if I'm not already, or just familiar myself. You also with have to juggle five or six panels because each one they needs their time. Yeah, and you know, sometimes some talk less, sometimes like yeah. more. So how are you like guiding, what's your process of guiding and make sure everybody kind of gets their moment? And yeah, yeah. That, I'm glad you brought that up. A lot of people don't realize that like I'm trying to actively pay attention to the panelists. I'm trying to make sure, okay, what question are we on? How much time do we have? And also I have like a few people like five minutes left, ten minutes left, <laughs> skip this question. I'm like, okay. Ah. And so it becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, how do I... I guess it, that just comes with experience, you know? Um, I'm very fortunate to where I have done a few now, so like a little bit of second nature there, but it is still, it is an active process. You're not just standing there asking questions. <laughs> yeah. Fall of the House of Usher. What was your initial reaction uh, when you first read the script? Uh, how are we gonna do this? That's yeah. literally the case. I'm like, in my head I'm like, okay, this is gonna be hard. But it's also good to have the challenge, you know. So that's that's the main thing about it. It was just like, you know, every every night I went to sleep and I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, uh, how are we going to finish this or how are we going to do it? But uh, that type of stuff, you know, you they say you solve most of your problems in your sleep. Uh, so for me, you know, I, unfortunately I couldn't build for that time, right. but I yeah I, <laughs> I I came up with uh, you know a lot of questions and a lot of ideas to talk with the team, uh, you know, and something like that. You you have to pull your team together. So it's not just you as an individual, you know, you have to have an entire crew there to help you uh, bring forth the ideas. So we would have sessions where we talked and bounced ideas off each other and say, well, what if we do this? Well, what about that? And how about this? So, so it's a real collaborative process. One thing I, I, I was thinking is multiple timelines must be an interesting challenge. It can be, yeah. yes, it can be. Uh, you know, for us, generally speaking, um, you know, we're, we're, pretty much you know locked into episodes timeline type stuff so so we don't have to worry too much about um, that aspect of it but uh, you know for uh, 
there is a progression, though, as far as timeline within the episode. So, like with the the acid bath sequence or acid shower, you know, there had to be a progression. So we we would hit our beats and say, okay, by this point they're going to be here. By this point they're going to be here. By this point, and that at least gave us the guideline to to run it by the showrunner and and the director and say, okay, here's where we're thinking. And if they say yes, then we just kind of fill in the blanks as we go. We've been asking a lot of them because I realize students are getting into the business, uh, graduating soon. Uh, one of my cameras is graduating this year, sadly. Uh, so my question is, when did you know that you could make money at doing what you love? Um, boy, that's a tough one because I didn't even think about that because it was what I loved. Mm. And I mean, there's some quote out there about, you know, if, you, if you're doing what you love, then you're... It's, you, you're not working, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, for me, it was uh, when I got out and started doing computer graphics way back in 1984, uh, I got my first job and making $12,000 a year. So I was thinking at that point in time, you know, maybe I made the wrong choice. I should have gone into programming instead of using the computers. Uh, and it just basically over time, you know, like I said, I've never really thought about it as far as, um, you know, I'm going to make this much money. You know, for me, it wasn't about that. It was, you know, you want to be comfortable. It was, it was mainly about I want to do what I want to do. I mean, you know, help create, help bring visuals. I used to read books a lot, so I would visualize the stuff up here. I could see how it could be done, and, and it's bringing that type of stuff out of the head onto the screen to help other people visualize it. So, so, more, so maybe your background was more in books then, like as, as, as your... As your teaching even when you didn't realize that you can do this as a career? Yeah, basically um, I had had some reading issues when I was young and I, I hit a, a really good teacher in third grade who got me involved in reading and then I became a voracious reader. But with the reading that I did, it also brought me out of the the, the shell that I had to open up the world. So because on a, you know, in the book, you, you know, as you're reading, you're not just reading words. You're, you're basically pushing that visualization, at least for me, you know, into my head, and that's what comes out. So it was, it was all, all the books are, were up here. They're still up here. So. All right, so we're going to get a little supernatural. Sure. <laughs> all right, so we'll actually the Winchester. So what was the challenge of, like, coming from Supernatural and setting up the sound for the Winchesters? So, yeah, um, one thing that we wanted to talk about was, <clears throat> excuse me, how we differentiate it, because it's, it is a new show, but it is obviously, it's, it's coming from Supernatural. Uh, at least from that world, because it's the the two main characters are um, the parents of the brothers on Supernatural. So there has to be there had to be some kind of tie-in, um, but um, but it needed to be distinct. And something that we settled on uh, early on was the horror elements. Uh, anything that had to do with it, anything that was just scary and and had that sort of uh, you know DNA. Um, we would use the same language that we used in Supernatural for uh, in Winchester. So any kind of like aleatoric uh, orchestral gestures, anything really dissonant and harsh, we would use. Would take what we used on Supernatural and use that on Winchester's whenever there'd be a pe appearance of a demon or mm -hmm. anything scary. And then um, so that was the through line. And then uh, because Winchester's took place in 1972. We thought, okay, maybe let's let's lean a little more acoustic, a little more organic, um, since a lot of supernatural could be very synth-driven, or um, when we used guitars, they tend to be more heavily distorted. Um, for this, for Winchester's, it was a little more, um, yeah, just a little. It had a lighter touch. It was more acoustic, more organic, and. Because it was a, about the love story between their two parents, um, uh, that uh, we felt it could just, yeah, like I said, just use a lighter touch, a little sweeter at times, and that's that's how that differentiated itself from from uh, the mothership, as we say. So creatively, you kind of like the idea of maybe taking the supernatural thing and expanding a little, like the romance, and do a little more different yeah. things. Exactly, because because there wasn't really, of course, there were romantic moments on Supernatural, but in general, it wasn't the thrust of the show. Um, and uh, whereas with Winchester's, it it absolutely was. Um, how um, 
these two people sort of get to know each other and form this bond as they fight monsters. <laughs> um, but it's more about more about their bond, ro more about their romantic bond than a fraternal bond. Um, the incredible animal journeys. We're going to talk some animal journeys. I love it. Amazing footage never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> some great things in that show. I love it. Which obviously it makes your job easier, yeah. I, I think. So what were the challenges for you trying to you know, come on board? Why did you want to come on board? And what were the biggest challenges of trying to work on the music for this? Um, my son and I watched these nature documentaries since he has been two, three years old. So it's something that's always been very much in our family. And so when the opportunity came about for me to work on one of these projects, it was amazing to be able to do this and have him come into the studio and kind of see some of the process with it too. Um, and being able to establish all these different themes for the different characters and working you know, with so many different people that had great creative ideas and being able to expand upon those and, and really run with it was, we were very lucky to be in that position. So what animal or character was the, fu uh, the funnest to work for? Or like, what was like, oh my God, this is awesome. Uh, I think the quirkiest character in the entire series are the Christmas Island red crabs. And the, uh, so, I mean, it's like a carpet, a red carpet that goes across this island, you know, when, they, when they're making their, their five-mile migration out to the ocean so that they can release their eggs. And uh, the directive was, we kind of want something a little, a little quirky, maybe like a dark circus. What does dark circus mean? <laughs> exactly. So um, we got to kind of dive in and just experiment with some different stuff. And it, it made him fun and kind of bouncy and, um, you know, evoke that kind of odd feeling of seeing these creatures scurry across the floor. <laughs> uh, what about dung beetles, though? <laughs> <laughs> well, the score wasn't... <laughs> But uh, no, just find, again, trying to find some some quirky elements. So there was a you know I used some percussion stuff like and different kind of weird things like that. There's some weird vocalizations in there. Um, you know, just trying to find something that's a little a little off about them. <laughs> well, obviously, it's a very creative problem. But this sounds like even more creative than normal. Like a lot of things you have to do differently. That you could you know. We don't have the story a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that one of the excitement for you? It it was, and especially because they wanted the main directive was to make it not sound like a typical BBC documentary. You know, they wanted a different sound to it. Also, this is a very narrative series. You're following either a mother and child or you're following, you know, a baby turtle whose mother, you know, kind of abandons them at birth. And so you keep coming back to these characters and seeing their initial large migration that they have to do and what they have to face, the challenges, the everything they have to do year after year um, to do this migration. And so, uh, you know, being able to work with the different, different creatures, different sounds, is, it was a lot of fun. The last question is, uh, you talk about your kid, uh, Pixar, though. Yeah. You got to work on Pixar, which I've heard notoriously they're very open musically to experimentation and stuff like that. What was your experience working on for Cars on the Road? Uh, again, another series where so many people involved and everybody had such great ideas. Each episode was had some influence from a pre-existing um, period or something. So there was a episode that kind of did a spoof on The Shining. There was another one that did this Mad Max kind of post-apocalyptic post thing and being able to do these big electric guitars and, you know, <laughs> where they, they draw their inspiration from. Again, we just, we have fun. And they like to get some stuff prior to them finishing animation also. So it's, the music really influences some of the visuals that they're going to they're gonna have in there also. Sounds like Pixar doesn't mind scaring kids by going in dark themes. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, we gotta we gotta make it light in some respects. So when you see little pity cars with these big mallets, you know, banging on drums as you know these guys are going through with flames flying out of the engines. I mean, you gotta make it fun. Okay, so Kung Fu Panda. Oh, what made you want to jump onto the series? Our agent sent us the brief. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a fun fun property, and also yeah. Jack Black was doing the voice, so it's like, how could you not want to do that? And and this show actually goes places. Like, it goes to like some darker places, which was fun to you know do something a little different than you know some of the films, and and you get to explore a bunch of different instruments you know and, and as they travel the world. So it's kind of fun to incorporate music of India, not only China but you know India, yeah, so the, England. The characters left China, and so we got to travel around the world with them and do lots of different music that wouldn't normally be in, in Kung Fu Panda. Right. So that's my question. So how much of it is you want to create? You got to create new original, like original music, but you also want to honor the franchise because. Right. So ha what is the juggling, balancing act? Trying to like make sure you keep it the way it's supposed to, but also not just you do more different things. Kind of. It is a yeah. yeah. What is a chat we had early on with them? So we're yeah. We want to be mindful of the sweeping scores of you know uh, John Powell and Hans Zimmer who scored the movies, right. but. Uh, 
I think once you get a TV show going and you, once you score 10, 20 episodes, they trust you, so you kind of open up the world to explore a bit more. Mm. And Yeah, I felt like a little bit of pressure at the start just because I think those scores are so great for the movies. Um, but thankfully, one thing the showrunner said was, this from, was like, we should do our own theme. Mm -hmm. So, And then he kind of encouraged us, don't, don't feel the pressure, just be inspired by it. Um, so that kind of shift in mentality um, just made it into something fun as opposed to like, I have to match, you know, match this, yeah. And how's it actually taken through the whole series? You get to develop and grow it where often you might come in just for an episode or a film where it's one and done. Right. What is the process for you? Like, oh, we actually, oh, we can tweak it. Oh, we can now evolve it. Sure. Well, kind of, as we mentioned, as they travel the world, you can take existing themes and play them on new instruments, which is kind of nice to show a character that we started off with you might you know, have their theme performed on a different instrument or a different key or whatever, and so it kind of shows a little evolution to their development. Um, and you know, th they really go through quite an adventure with the story through 40 episodes, so I think exploring those initial themes and how can you manipulate them in interesting ways. Yeah, definitely. I remember um, we start off with like the villains just having a four-note little motif for them, but then later in the show, we find out their backstory, and so we almost start to empathize with them. So we could take those four notes and then have it be almost more like a melody with, you know, some emotional chords underneath. So, yeah. Which actually is my big question. Like, so when, when you're doing a series like that, do you want to know the full arc of each character, or do you say, uh oh, wait a minute, if I know the person is the villain, I might change the score, but the audience shouldn't. So how do you juggle that? Do you want to know in advance, or do you want to go episode by episode? I personally would like to know because I, I, one thing that's fun for me is kind of like planning it and having this puzzle and how do all the pieces fit together. Um, but that rarely happens. And maybe sometimes the, sh the people writing the show don't even know where you're going to end up, you know. Yeah. It's sometimes nice to know, but then how can you leave the trail of like <laughs> lightly indicating that things might, as Bob said, maybe there's a little more character development to the antagonist, but you don't want to be like too sympathetic yet, of course. but how can you kind of find that balance? Yeah, you know? like if you found out these two characters were going to be sibli like or siblings, like maybe at the start you'd build their themes from like yeah some common like like note motif um, that then later on like it manifests in a way where it's obvious or I don't know. Well, it's foreshadowing. You know, like a writer will try to foreshadow, you, but you, but you don't want to give it away either, though. Right. Like the kind of foreshadowing where it's like you don't realize it's foreshadowing until you rewatch the series or something like that. Yeah. Are you touched on it for our final question? You touched on it. Okay, for a kid series, this gets dark. Hmm. How fun is it doing music for a children's show where you can actually kind of scare the kids or, you know, go for darker places? I think that's uh, one of the great parts of this TV show is that you can kind of share with children that, you know, through the ups and, like, how can you bring them from the darkness back to the light? Or, like, how can you go there without... And what, what's the lesson learned from that? And that going to a scary place doesn't have to be... Terrifying, per se, it might be terrifying in the moment, but then how can you grow from it, you know, and endure? Our flag means death. Okay, so what made you want to become a pirate and come on board the ship? <laughs> uh, the creator, the show creator, David Jenkins. Um, he and I worked together on a show about aliens that no one knows about, People of Earth. It was like an underrated show that I loved, and I loved working with him. So it was the creator that wanted me, uh, or wanted me to come on board and made me want to come on board. Um, and I didn't think I was going to connect with the material, to be honest. Um, but it's a love story, and I connected more than I have with almost anything I've worked on. I love that show so much. I was so inspired musically to with that show. In the Actually, interesting, you led to my question. So if you have that situation where you're not connecting, so you do have to find something you can connect dramatically to the story to yeah. actually do the music. Oh, yeah. I think you do. Um, and like I said, I didn't think I would connect to it, but it's probably one of the shows I've connected to the most, I think, because it was just such a pure love story. Um, and the actors were so good, and then I fell in love with every character in there. Yeah, but yeah, you do have to connect. I do. I have to emotionally connect to the story and the characters mm -hmm. to be able to listen effectively um, and represent. Yeah. So uh, if, you do, if you're scoring the whole series, let's say multiple episodes, which is that case, do you want to know the arc of the story, or do you want to focus on each episode? Because you, know, you want to think, like, what is the audience supposed to be in this place? I don't want to know if the character dies, for example. Yeah, no. Well, also, I, I don't score. I, I select the songs. Yeah, so I'm like I'm in charge of the soundtrack. Um, I want to know the arc. Yeah, and I and, and where it's going. Yes, because you don't want to. Because I, I think with scoring, it's a little different because you're hitting narrative beats. With songs, you're um, 
it's bigger moments. So like, mm. you know, like if I know their love story, where it's going towards the end of the season, I'm going to, and I know I'm going to go big in episode eight. I want to pull back a little bit in two and three to like, so there's room to grow. So Now Fargo is a slightly different tone than Flag. But what was the emotional connection for Fargo? Mm, that's a good question. Um, Fargo, you're more connected with the material, for me at least, less to the characters and more to the story and um, the world, uh, if that makes sense. Because um, I think it's more of, it's not as intimate. It's more of a style and a fable and, um, and a vibe. So I connect to the, to the totality of it and the world that we've created. Um, which is very energizing and inspiring too. Just very, it's just different. It's not. Um, it wasn't. I. Yeah. It was this. This season in particular, there wasn't really a love story. I guess I connected to the rage and anger uh, of Juno Temple's character. Mm. Yeah. And then now you. Now you're also doing the great. Yeah. yeah the, the great has been canceled. I know. I'm so bummed because I love that show. Uh, but I was working with Tony uh, McNamara, who was a, who's a very unique visionary. Yeah, he's brilliant. I love him. I love him. He's a kind, kind man. And um, really, God, every time I got a script, I would be super excited to read it. He's such a good writer. So is Noah. And so is David. I mean, I, I'm very fortunate that the people I work with are phenomenal writers. Um, Tony uh, is very collaborative. Like, he really let me do my thing, which was very generous and um and kind of him and he was also super respectful that whole crew was great and it started from the top tony and mary and mac uh, mary and mcgowan um they ran the show and everyone was very respectful every everyone was kind very collaborative and it was uh, a unicorn of a show as far as the content and what we created but then also behind the scenes was just really special now you also have your own deep cuts where you have your own women uh, independent uh, what what is that? What did, why do you create that? What has that given you as a freedom as an artist? Uh, I a team that I love. Uh, I mean, it's nice to have. I only have two employees. It's just the three of us <laughs> working on our shows, but um, I I adore them and we really support each other and and work really hard on what we do. And it, it's like it's us against everyone, you know, like not against, but working for everyone. But we we really have each other's backs. Well, yeah. it's a very isolating world sometimes. The industry can be very isolating. So it sounds like having a partners and teams, even if they're not working on the same project as you, just kind of like notes or encouragement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, yeah. If, God, if I, it is isolating. I work from home. We All three of us work from home. One is in L.A., I'm in Austin, and then um, one is in Portland. Um, if I didn't have them next to me, I would not be able to do this. Like the support, the compassion, mm -hmm. the encouragement, the ideas, the creative, like someone to just like, bounce ideas off of and then someone to just also like talk to after a hard meeting you know like just yeah it's just support <laughs> I mean Bean it's a beloved children's book uh, so what were the challenges for you like what what why do you want to come on board too well I came on board because of my relationship with the director Alyssa Down so I, I'd worked with her for like since 2007 so I just do all of her films so she it's more that she calls me and says we're going on this ride next and I'm like okay let's go uh, but it's interesting because her career you know she she done a lot of um, teenage stories like late teenage mm -hmm. you know early 20s stories and this is the first time she's done a children's um, story so it was an interesting challenge and Alyssa has a quirkiness to her and to, to the way she tells stories very heavily reliant on score and on music too but in the past it's been I guess older a bit more angsty a bit more teenagey early 20s but now you know it's like no this is you know this is um, innocence, this is imagination, this is, you know, there's terror, you know, but from a child's perspective, you know, so it was fun to just do something completely different and, um, and, and magical. And plus, but you also have to, you also want to keep it a little dark. I mean, you have to keep it a little edgy and it's for children. So what was the balancing like? Could you realize these are for kids? But we also want to, you know, kind of get in their heads a little. <laughs> well, but that's the thing. Like, that's why I said terror, because yeah. it's terror, but it's from a child's perspective. Like, there are three movies, and the middle one is kind of a ghost story. Yeah. So, and so the, um, and the direction also from Netflix as well was like, 
we don't want to scare kids off. Like we want them to be a little bit scared, but we don't want so scared that they'll turn it off, right? So the thing is, it's you know, and a lot of that is the music. You're like, if you make, you know, I, I do a lot of horror. I know how to scare people with music, so I had to restrain myself. <laughs> and it was like, how can you be dark but within the paradigm of a world for children? You know. So like on the first draft, you didn't you didn't submit something like the vigil. And say this is the score. This is what I want. I want a really dark, dark. And then Netflix said, "Whoa, <laughs> that's right." Well, it's funny because we used the same orchestra um, uh, as on Cabinet of Curiosities, right? And it was like literally like the the recording session for Airbnb were like a month later. So you know, like it, I'm sure that the orchestra was surprised when they opened the music. They're like, "Hang on." This looks different to what we just did. You know, there's no like snaking runs and like string slides and, you know, like atonal clusters. I'm like, yeah, this one's going to be a bit different. But at the same time, must, your horror background must have helped a lot because you do have to add that. Obviously, pull it back, but with that experience, this might have been a harder thing to score. I think, um, I think it, running the gamut of emotion is definitely that, that was the fun challenge. It's like we. we we want to be funny. We also want to be a little bit scary. We want to be adventurous, and we want to be um, uh, always pushing the story forward. It has to have a real sense of momentum all the time, in a way that can engage a young audience. We never want them to be bored. We want them on the edge of their seat, going, you know, what's going to happen to our heroes? You know, I mean, like, what are they going to do next? You know, so and all of that plays into it, including some of the, you know, like the horror stuff. The, you know, there's in the first movie, there's quite a significant you know, bad guy, for want of a better word, and it's like you, you are trying to, yeah, the kids are trying to escape her. So, yeah, that, that feeling of fear and needing to escape definitely plays into it. We have a lot of students, like aspiring, you know, musicians, art directors, writers. Uh, so do you recommend maybe for the younger students trying to learn, make sure you do multiple genres or don't, don't lock yourself in, explore as much as possible because it feeds into everything? Rather than... So it's interesting. So uh, rather than write, because I, I hear a lot of composers and they, you know, they, the younger composers, and they send me reels, and you know, it's like this is me doing Star Wars, or this is me doing John, you know, John Williams. This is me doing, you know, Hans Zimmer. This is me doing this and that. I think it's better to find your own voice um, as a composer, but definitely watch everything. Like watch a ton of movies. You know, like don't just watch one kind of movie. Like just watch as much as you possibly can, and not just recent movies. Go back. Watch the 80s movies. They're the best. <laughs> you know, watch 70s, watch 60s, watch 50s. But expose yourself to as much cinematic language as possible because it's going to feed into your, uh, let's say, library as an artist. And maybe not always watch things in your comfort zone either. That's right. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Like, you know, like for a student today, go watch a movie from the 50s. You know, like, are you, like you know, just expose yourself to like Bernard Herrmann. Go do that. What, uh, what inspired you to want to moderate this panel? Well, uh, it was more of a, an agent saying that there was an opportunity to do so. And uh, I'm pretty comfortable um, speaking in large groups, small groups. I was the spokesperson for TD Ameritrade for about five years, and all that was sitting on the couch talking to people about their finances. So um, I'm pretty comfortable in, in this environment. And uh, so I jumped on the opportunity. From experience, I know moderating panels can always be challenging. You got to balance the questions. So, how did you prepare, making sure everybody had their time to shine, and you know, got a chance to share in the experience? Well, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these type of, of things, they will they will give you your questions that you're going to ask people. But uh, if you just stick to that, I think uh, it'll ring hollow to not only the audience but the panelists. So, you have enough time before you have to get there to search the people that you're interviewing. Um, you know, there's plenty of things on YouTube to get some more background. So I was able to do some follow-up questions uh, based on what they were saying and also just what I learned about them on my own. So I think if you just stick to the script, it's fine. But uh, it's, I think it's appreciated when you actually, you know, try to find out about the people you're going to be talking to. And, and the research helps because sometimes you learn what not to ask them. Oh yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah, you want to be you want to be real careful and, and pick up on things that they might be sensitive to. But usually the questions are are safe enough and they're within the the industry standards. So uh, I don't I don't worry about going too uh, out in the left field. For music though, it's interesting because music uh, is such a it's such a unique art form. How was was the challenge of kind of like asking music questions and getting you know to the heart of the music? 
Well, uh, a lot of composing for film and television, I think, um, has to do with heart and feel. So I didn't have to focus so much on um, the actual m musical skills, the composing skills of the individuals, or in Maggie's case, um, her ability to um, get the music that she wants on a particular show. I just think that uh, I can connect to the emotional um, a part of music, and I, I, fe I figured it was a good to stay there. And also, when you're doing a panel in front of you know, a bunch of people, it's not everybody's going to be a musician out there. So you kind of want to stay in terms that they can, they can understand. So I, 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 I kept it uh, not inside baseball. <laughs> yeah.